A stack of lawsuits against Illinois' gun and magazine ban now in front of the U.S. Supreme Court with a motion for writ. And that's to have the U.S. Supreme Court hear the cases and what makes this different than previous attempts at trying to get the U.S. Supreme Court to intervene in looking at Illinois' gun and magazine ban. While I talk to the experts who are involved in all of this, from the National Association for Gun Rights, to the Second Amendment Foundation, to the Illinois State Rifle Association, and we bring that to you now here with Bishop on Air. Good morning. Uh, hopefully you check in with us live and join the live conversation. Tons of people there having talks with each other. Uh, also, uh, be sure to check out bishoponair.com, or you can join the Discord server as well. Uh, but let's go ahead and get on into this with uh, the people involved in these cases. And let's start with the Second Amendment Foundation. I chatted with Alan Gottlieb yesterday about uh, ultimately what uh, his organization is doing with the case uh, for Harold v. Raul. And here's Alan Gottlieb talking about uh, how this filing is different from previous filings to the U.S. Supreme Court filed yesterday. Well, it's, it's current law that we're challenging. Uh, I can't say what makes it different. Uh, the Second Amendment Foundation filed a cert petition with the Supreme Court over the Maryland assault and ban last week, which has been kicking around longer than the Illinois one. And now we just filed the one on the Illinois. So the Supreme Court now has two cert petitions before challenging the so-called assault weapon bans. Uh, and with the two of them on their plate now, uh, we're pretty sure that we're going to get considered. So with this case, uh, you've got uh, the filing that was made uh, and Gottlieb talking about uh, the, what they're ultimately arguing here, and especially with the lower courts, Seventh Circuit Court, seeming to uh, characterize AR-15s as military use firearms. Is the lower court thumbing their nose at the Supreme Court? We believe they are thumbing their nose at the uh Heller, McDonald, and Bruin precedents at the U.S. Supreme Court. In our opinion, there's no historical data that shows that these type of weapons sh you know, should have been banned. The Founding Fathers, I think, considered the, these things at that time. There's no precedents. The language is pretty clear in the Second Amendment. Uh, these really aren't military-grade weapons. They only fire a semi-automatic. They don't fire a fully automatic. We believe that, that the Supreme Court is going to rectify this situation and declare these so-called assault and ban laws unconstitutional. And again, uh, talking with Alan Gottlieb from the Second Amendment Foundation yesterday after it was announced that they have filed with the U.S. Supreme Court challenging Illinois' gun and magazine ban after the Second Amendment Foundation filed with the Supreme Court to challenge Maryland's gun and magazine ban. So there are multiple challenges in front of the U.S. Supreme Court dealing with this issue, but I asked Alan about the numbers in Illinois where you've got uh, registration about 1.4 some odd percent of the total FOID card holders. Uh, you're looking at before the December 31st deadline, 29,557, 357 rather, 29,357 individuals completing an affidavit saying that they own uh, banned items. And then after that January 1st deadline, these numbers have yet to be updated. Uh, just doing a refresh here, and it's still at uh, an additional 6,262 individuals who have filed. And again, that's of the 2.4 million firearm owner identification card holders. Uh, I asked Gottlieb about uh, what this means for, you know, this measure directly impacting gun owners. And if gun owners aren't complying, uh, what does that say about the effectiveness of this law? People impacted by these gun ban laws surely uh, don't believe these laws are constitutional. And as a result, you can see from the registration data that the compliance rate is close to zero. So what do we do, though, with the Southern District case? We've been tracking that, and we will continue to track that here with Bishop on Air. Uh, on Friday last week, the judge issued a schedule for February 28th for the various plaintiffs' lawyers to have a conference with the judge to talk about moving forward on the merits and looking at the evidence that they want to present and the witnesses and the testimony they want to present. Uh, in that case, moving forward on the merits. This after the Southern District of Illinois last April issued a preliminary injunction that was ultimately put on pause by the Seventh Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals before they ruled in favor of the state. Uh, so you've got the Southern District now saying, OK, all preliminary issues aside, let's get to the merits on this. Uh, how is that going to impact the uh, the filings in front of the U.S. Supreme Court? 
Well, I believe that all these cases are going to be heard by the U.S. Supreme Court. So they're probably going to consolidate a significant number of these assault and ban cert petitions all in one fell swoop and, uh, and, and take the responsibility to set these lower courts straight that they can't thumb their nose at the U.S. Supreme Court prior decisions. But should the Southern District be on pause while we await whatever outcome from the U.S. Supreme Court in whether or not they're even going to take these cases? Because I think that's important here. They just filed with these cases. Well, it could very well put it on pause. And, and again, the Maryland case that we just filed last week might get to the Supreme Court quicker than the Illinois case. Uh, but if they take any one of these assault and ban cases at the U.S. Supreme Court and rule it in our favor for constitutional rights, it's going to knock out all these laws. So Alan Gottlieb, of course, with the Second Amendment Foundation, they are uh, plaintiffs in the Harrell case. Also in the Harrell case, because, again, you've got uh, you know, three Illinois cases that filed for cert requesting the U.S. Supreme Court to hear their cases three of them filing yesterday on top of the Maryland ban challenge being filed last week. So you've got the Herald case, you've got the Barnett case, and you've got the Beavis case. That's out of the Northern District of Illinois. Uh, so these three different cases from Illinois uh, going in and asking the U.S. Supreme Court to hear the case. Uh, as part of the Harrell case, the Illinois State Rifle Association Executive Director Richard Pearson, I also connected with him yesterday to get his thoughts uh, on the stack of lawsuits now uh, requesting the U.S. Supreme Court uh, to take these cases. Right, which makes me very happy because the Supreme Court will then get the idea that people are concerned about this and maybe they'll take one of the cases or all of them. And probably, my guess is they probably take them all at once and hear them all at once. But what do we do about that Southern District case, which Harrell is a part of? Uh, Pearson says that uh, he foresees that, uh, you know, they, they could uh, slow that case down possibly. Well, because it, it takes out all, all these cases. I mean, everything is going to stop now that these cases have been appealed to the Supreme Court. So the cases in the lower courts probably are going to wait until the Supreme Court makes a ruling. Is but uh, the question there uh, seemed to have been addressed. When was that? Earlier this year, uh, whenever the Southern District of Illinois, uh, Judge Stephen McGlynn was hearing from plaintiffs. Plaintiffs, if you recall, and you look back at the video archive, uh, plaintiffs were requesting a stay on the Southern District case on the merits. And a stay essentially says, let's put it on pause. Because the plaintiffs said they were preparing to file with the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, but Judge Stephen McGlynn, uh, he said, no, we're going to move forward with this. And even Thomas Mag with the Langley plaintiffs, and I think that they're still lingering out there as to whether they're going to file cert with the U.S. Supreme Court. But even Thomas Mag said, even if we file for cert with the U.S. Supreme Court, that does not mean that the U.S. Supreme Court's going to take the cases. So it would be uh, conducive to move forward with the merits and to go through those steps with the merits of the case. But Richard Pearson, I asked him, should the Southern District be on pause? It's possible, but we are ahead of the deadline. The deadline was March 10th or 11th, and so we're a month ahead of the deadline. So we're trying to push this case through so we can get a ruling by the end of June. So we'll see uh, if they indeed do get to a ruling by the end of June. Uh, Richard Pearson here also, uh, you know, speculating if uh, the Southern District should uh, go ahead and uh, take up that case uh, with the Southern District of Illinois moving forward on the merits of the case. Well, the Southern District is going to do what the Southern District is going to do, but in the past, we've seen the scenario that if, if there's a case pending before the Supreme Court, all the other cases get slowed down or stopped or wait. And I just uh, realized that my live stream did pause, so hopefully you guys are back into it. Uh, and this is also why we record things locally so we can upload them uh, in, in the morning and get it out to you. Uh, so uh, if you if you got interrupted with the live stream, be sure to check back with the uh, uh, the recorded segments that we will upload. Uh, but uh, more from Richard Pearson uh, from the Illinois State Rifle Association. What else should listeners know about where we're headed with all of this? Well, I think they need to uh, wait and see what happens. We've got a lot of cases in, all across the country. I mean, you got the Maryland case. we got the California case that 
is out there. And so we've got ours, and we've got the uh, National Shooting Sports Foundation case. And now it looks like we got National Gun Rights going up with the Beavis case. So, uh, but we also mentioned the Beavis case in ours. But, but anyway, so there's a lot of stuff going on right now, and and I'm I look I'm looking forward to get this resolved. So uh, we'll talk with uh, the National Association for Gun Rights. I'll share the conversation I had with Hannah Hill from yesterday with you in just moments. But uh, with the uh, Illinois State Rifle Association, I did want to just put this in front of you as well. They do have Illinois Gun Owner Lobby Day scheduled, uh, and that is set for April 18th. And uh, they've got uh, a variety of speakers lined up. Uh, It's going to be in Springfield, starting at the Bank of Springfield Center, so the the uh, arena there in Springfield, and again April eighteenth, uh, it starts at uh, ten o'clock. And then you've got uh, the the march through the state capitol to the Capitol building uh, and a uh, variety of other events. So uh, that's again April eighteenth, twenty twenty four. Coming up, um, we'll talk with Richard about uh, that more in the future here with Bishop on air. But uh, again, you've got the Herald case that filed with the Second Amendment Foundation, the Illinois State Rifle Association. You've got the uh, Barnett plaintiffs that filed with the U.S. Supreme Court, and uh, the both of those are in the Southern District of Illinois right now. But now they're asking for uh, the U.S. Supreme Court to rule on the merits of the case. Uh, So what about the Northern District case? I chatted with uh, National Association for Gun Rights uh, President uh, Hannah Hill, uh, and she talked about uh, the Beavis case and how, listen, they've gone to the U.S. Supreme Court two different times to ask the U.S. Supreme Court to intervene in the case. But since now, the Seventh Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals has ruled in favor of the state and issued the mandate, which I think is important because they can't move forward with the next steps until that mandate was issued. And that was issued earlier this year uh, off the November ruling that the Seventh Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals made. But Hannah Hill, uh, she talks about uh, the the difference of yesterday's filing from the two previous filings that they had made. Right. Those two attempts were emergency appeals, right? What we were asking for was not a ruling on the case itself, but rather a temporary emergency stay of the underlying law and ordinance. What we're asking for now is an actual ruling on the case. We're appealing the Seventh Circuit's ruling, uh, that uh, the denial of preliminary injunction, the ruling that said basically that AR-15s aren't guns under the Second Amendment, because that's the only way they could figure out how to uphold the assault weapons ban. Um, what we're, what, it's uh, officially an appeal for certiorari. And so um, the Supreme Court rarely takes emergency appeals. Um, so neither of those attempts, when we filed them, they were both Hail Marys and we weren't that surprised um, when the Supreme Court said no. Um, however, both of those got more traction than we had expected, uh, which leaves us very hopeful for the official cert p- petition that we just filed today. So yeah, that's, we're, we're appealing on the case itself now. Um, and this is something that we have every hope that the Supreme Court will look at. So with the uh, ongoing filings here, when I chatted with Hannah Hill yesterday, uh, talked about uh, the difference here uh, and also the different circuits that are involved uh, because you have the Maryland case also in on this. Uh, And now you've got uh, that with three other cases from Illinois challenging bans on semi-automatic firearms. Well, it should uh, matter. It should weigh heavily with the Supreme Court, the fact that they've got multiple lawsuits out of two separate federal circuits um, on the exact same issue, right? So we don't have a circuit split. And the reason we don't have a circuit split is because uh, the only states that actually ban assault weapons are the ones where there is a concentration of of liberal politicians, including in the judiciary, which means the only places that pass these laws are going to be in places where it's unlikely you'll be able to succeed in getting a court ruling that's going to um, overturn those laws. So that makes it hard to get a circuit split. So what we have is the next best thing. We have pending petitions on this exact law coming from two different federal circuits. Another thing that we've emphasized to the court in our petition is that no contested case, in no contested case over assault weapons bans or magazine bans, have has a court ruled against the ban, right? So we are 13 to zero 
for assault weapons ban rulings where the ban itself is upheld in violation of Bruin and in violation of the Supreme Court. Um, what we try to emphasize as well is that this is a very serious thing and it points to a very concerning pattern um, in the lower courts, much like they did in the days following Heller and McDonald in 2008 and 2010, when we had those awesome Supreme Court rulings that upheld gun rights, the lower courts systematically ignored and defied those rulings, found a way around them, and began ruling um, to, against gun rights, just as if those, uh, those rulings, those precedents did not exist. Um, we are on that track now with Bruin. And it's going to be up to the Supreme Court to step in and say, no, we meant what we said when we said that the Second Amendment is not a second class right subject to an entirely different body of guarantee, a different set of guarantees as the rest of the Bill of Rights um, guarantees as well. So that's kind of what we're hoping will happen. Um, we hope that the fact that there are so many, uh, particularly, like I said, coming from multiple circuits, sitting before the Supreme Court at the same time, that will make it harder for the Supreme Court to say no. Um, and yeah, we're hope, I mean, it would be great to see the Supreme Court just consolidate them all. They might as well, it's the same issue. Um, the issue is, can the Supreme Court, or sorry, can state governments and local governments ban guns that are in common use, right? Um, and we're asking as well, in ours, if the, Heller, um, if the Heller ruling can be cabined to the actual facts um, that were under consideration with that ruling. In other words, is it true that if a, if a weapon, whether it's a handgun or a rifle, if it's in common use for lawful purposes, is it true that there is no way that a ban of that gun can be constitutional? Because, because that was the holding of Heller. But that holding was specifically applied to handguns. What the Seventh Circuit tried to do is say, well, it was only handguns, so you can't apply it to rifles as well. And so we've asked the Supreme Court to weigh in on that also. So talking with uh, Hannah Hill yesterday, also asked her about uh, how Robert Beavis is uh, holding up with all of this. Of course, Robert Beavis, uh, the owner of Law Weapons, the chief plaintiff in the case Beavis v. Naperville. Uh, how's he holding up with all of this? So um, Robert Beavis, um, you know, we've we've mentioned this before. Um, he has run into great difficulties uh, keeping his business going. Um, last time I talked to him, his business was hanging on by a thread. Um, it's it's very challenging when the state and when the local government first, so he's in worse shape than the rest of the gun dealers in, in the state because Naperville started in on him first. Um, when they ban what, the, what consisted of the majority of your product. Um, so he is also a gunsmith um, and you know, he's been looking for ways to uh, continue to serve the people of, of Naperville and Illinois, but it's been a struggle. It's been a real struggle for him. And then uh, to the timeline of all of this, you've got uh, these three cases yesterday filing to the U.S. Supreme Court from Illinois, stacked on top of the Maryland case, challenging gun bans in that state. Now in front of the U.S. Supreme Court, asking for them to review. Uh, are we going to see a quick turnaround on the U.S. Supreme Court taking one or all or consolidating these cases? What does that timeline look like? Uh, again, Hannah Hill from the National Association for Gun Rights. Well, this is the waiting game. This is not the fun part. And when it comes to um, a petition for cert at the Supreme Court, you can be waiting for months. So, for instance, um, Bruin itself, it was filed in December, the petition for that. It was filed in late December. Um, it wasn't until the following April that the Supreme Court granted cert. And that is what I would kind of consider a short turnaround. Um, it can take months and months. It can take a year. Um, we hope it won't. And we are uh, glad to see, you know, the, the Bianchi case out of, out of Maryland and all the other Illinois cases. We hope that this will up the urgency for the Supreme Court, but they're not on a time limit. They're not, they're on their own time, so they can take it whenever they want to. Um, and it is also true that while they will have to eventually weigh in on this, this issue, because this is core to the Second Amendment right, um, and if they're serious about what they said in Bruin, they're going to have to take this specific issue of assault weapons bans at some point. That said, um, just by way of example, there were a lot of bump stock cases that got appealed to the Supreme Court before the court finally took one, um, the most recent one, Cargill versus uh, Garland. So we hope that won't happen here, um, but I do think that if the Supreme Court decides to delay it, 
will be very disappointed, um, especially because we had hoped that this particular court would recognize that a right delayed is a right denied. They've already dragged their feet a lot on this very issue. We think that they should have taken at least one of our emergency appeals and provided at least a temporary level of relief. Um, but if they're not going to do that, they need to take one of these cases, preferably all of them, and they need to weigh in and to smack down the lower court's defiance um, of what they said in both Heller and Bruin. So again, uh, that's Hannah Hill from the National Association for Gun Rights uh, in a conversation I had with her yesterday as a stack of lawsuits now in front of the U.S. Supreme Court requesting that they actually review and hear these cases. Uh, let's just take a brief look here at uh, some of the filings that have been made. Uh, and this is, of course, looking at the documents, the Harold v. Raul case uh, that was filed yesterday. And questions presented whether the Constitution allows the government to prohibit law-abiding responsible citizens from protecting themselves, their families, and their home with semi-automatic firearms that are in common use for lawful purposes, whether the Constitution allows the government to prohibit law-abiding responsible citizens from protecting themselves, their families, and their homes with ammunition magazines that are in common use for lawful purposes, and whether enforcement of Illinois' semi-automatic firearm and ammunition magazine bans should be enjoined. So those are the questions presented in that particular case. What about uh, the case that uh, the National Association for Gun Rights and Robert Beavis have against the state? Uh, the questions presented is the state of Illinois' ban of certain handguns constitutional in light of the holding in D.C. versus Heller, that handgun bans are categorically unconstitutional. Is the in common use test announced in D.C. versus Heller hopelessly uh, circular and therefore unworkable? And can the government ban the sale, purchase, and possession of certain semi-automatic firearms and firearm magazines that are possessed by millions of law-abiding Americans for lawful purposes when there is no analogous founding era regulations? Uh, let's take a look now at uh, the uh, Barnett case that was filed for cert in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, this as well has uh, questions presented. In 2015, a divided Seventh Circuit panel held that states should be allowed to decide when civilians can possess firearms that they deem in their discretion to be, quote, military grade, so long as they leave their citizens with other adequate means of self-defense. Friedman versus uh, the city of Highland Park. The future author of New York State Rifle and Pistol Association Incorporated versus Bruin lambasted that decision as flouting this court's precedence and relegating the Second Amendment to a second-class right. Uh, goes on to say, yet after Bruin seamlessly seemingly uh, interred the reasoning of decisions like Friedman and Illinois responded not by confronting existing law to Bruin, but with defiance, banning upwards to a thousand previously lawful rifles, pistols, and shotguns, plus their respective parts and common magazines, a divided panel of the Seventh Circuit resurrected Friedman, declaring its approach not only basically compatible with, but more useful than Bruin, which is derided as slippery, circular, and not very helpful. The majority then took its disregard of Bruin one giant step further, concluding that Illinois' sweeping ban does not even implicate the Second Amendment. Not surprisingly, the decision drew a sharp dissent and created a circuit split to boot. The question presented is whether Illinois' sweeping ban on common and law long lawful arms violates the Second Amendment. So uh, again, you, you can kind of see there some of the arguments that uh, the plaintiffs are raising in these cases that they have filed to the U.S. Supreme Court. And uh, what happens next is going to be interesting, especially when you look at, uh, as, as Todd Vandermeid shared with me this morning on a phone call, and he talked about it uh, with his most recent video, and I expect to see more from Todd Vandermeid, Freedom's Steel on YouTube, uh, about uh, the Cargill case. And the bump stock ban uh, and the challenge against that. And then you get into the ultimate definition of what's a semi-automatic firearm. And if the ATF is going to say, hey, we need bump stocks to be banned because it converts a semi-automatic firearm into a machine gun. Uh, then, you know, if, a, if the government's saying that these are semi-automatic firearms that are allowed and uh, a bump stock converts that to a machine gun, then... You know, if, if that's the argument the government's taking, isn't it kind of uh, on the 
opposite end of what the Seventh Circuit said about AR-15s being, you know, military grade and machine guns. Uh, so you look at how all of this interconnects. It's going to be a fascinating ride. And I hope that you guys stay with me here with Bishop on air each and every weekday morning, chiming in, giving you the latest that you need to know, uh, talking to the experts. So hopefully it has been uh, informative and enlightening as to where we go from here. Uh, so I greatly appreciate you guys being with me each and every weekday morning. Be sure to like, subscribe, hit that notification bell. Uh, that way you can know when we go live. And if you miss any of the live sections, then you can go back and watch the uh, recorded stuff that we upload. So I appreciate you guys being here each and every weekday morning. Uh, again, follow me anywhere. Just search Bishop on air. Uh, all one word, Bishop on air. Check out the website bishoponair.com and uh, we'll be back uh, with more as always here with Bishop on Air.